the third episode in our Suicide Postvention podcast series. My name is Sarah Nazem, and I'm a clinical research psychologist at the Rocky Mountain Monarch, and I'll be your host for today's podcast. During our previous episodes, we've given an overview on what suicide postvention is and the impact that suicide loss can have on friends and family members. Today, our episode focuses specifically on the professional caregiver's experience of suicide loss an area of critical importance that is sometimes overlooked when thinking about suicide postvention. We are joined by Dr. Nina Guten and Dr. Vanessa McGann. Thanks so much for joining us today, Nina and Vanessa. Let's begin by having you provide a brief introduction of yourself. I'm Vanessa McGann. I'm a clinical psychologist in New York City. I have a private practice and I work at a college counseling center. In addition to that, I do a lot of work in suicide postvention. Um, I specialize in traumatic loss. I've done a lot of consulting with agencies and schools on postvention after a death by suicide. And along with Nina, I'm co-chair of the um, American Association for Suicidology's Clinician Survivor Task Force. And we do that together to support clinicians who have lost a loved one or a client to suicide. Um, I got into this work because in 2004, I lost my sister, Nadine, to suicide. And hi, I'm Nina Guten. Uh, I am also a clinical psychologist. I have a private practice in Pasadena, California. In addition, I do trainings in suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. I'm on the advisory board for the Los Angeles Suicide Prevention Center out of Dee Dee Hirsch, and I facilitate survivors after suicide groups and work with survivors after suicide in my private practice. I'm also a member of the Los Angeles Department of Mental Health Suicide Prevention Network, and as Vanessa mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the Clinician Survivors Task Force. Uh, I lost my brother to suicide in 1995, and that's driven pretty much all of the suicide-related activities that I'm involved with now. Well, great. Thank you again both for joining us today. I think all of our listeners from hearing your introduction um, should know what amazing pioneers you have been in the field for suicide postvention, especially as it relates to thinking about the impact on professional caregivers. So that's where I'd like to start. Um, I was hoping that one of you could talk to us a little bit more about what types of professional caregivers are exposed to patient or client suicide. Who does that group entail? Sure, I can speak to that. I mean, I, I think that there are that no caregiver is immune from having a loss to suicide. Um, you know, there's various statistics about half of psychiatrists will lose. Uh, patient over the course of their careers, um, psychologists, social workers, counselors, about a third of us will will encounter a loss of a client to suicide. And then there's clergy, school professionals, um, anyone really who's working with someone is at risk of, of having that kind of loss. Um, unfortunately, it's more common among trainees, and often when I'm doing uh, trainings on it, I ask people what what their thoughts are about that. Sometimes they say they think that trainees are, you know, less skillful, they have less experience working with suicidal individuals. What's really the case is that trainees um, are working with higher risk populations, and that's really unfortunate because the impact of a loss of suicide on trainees can be so profound, and it can lead a lot of them to just decide to leave the, the field or not enter into the field. Thank you. I think our listeners probably know from just working with other colleagues that everything that you talked about there is so true in terms of the personal and professional side. What I'm interested to hear a little bit more on are um, either of you or maybe both of your perspectives on how we can improve awareness about this idea of twin bereavement. So I think it's something that we know to be true from the literature, and we definitely know from personal experiences either for ourselves or working with others. But one thing that I know is that it's not often talked about, and that's due to some of the uh, things that you mentioned, Nina, too, about um, stigma 
I'm curious, you know, what you all have in terms of thoughts and how we can improve awareness of all of those things that Nina just talked about. Sure, I'll speak to that. And I want to say that it's kind of what what we call a twin bereavement um, in that it has virtually the same personal effects as, say, anyone else losing someone close to them to suicide. And in addition, there are professional components. So I'll start by describing some of the very common personal effects that any survivor of suicide tends to experience with the caveat that it's not one all one size fits all. This is a, a very devastating and traumatic loss. Um, so after this loss, there's often PTSD symptoms, a sense of shock, derealization. It, it just doesn't seem real. Um, some of the other very common themes that this loss has as compared to other types of loss is a sense of guilt, whether or not it's justified. A sense of I must have done something wrong or I must have missed something, along with constant, almost incessant questioning. Why did this happen? What did I miss? What should I have done? What could I have done? Um, and that tend to sort of almost feel to the person like they're being eaten alive by these types of questions. It's a very existential type of loss. It shatters all sorts of assumptions um, for parents who lose their kids. What kind of parent am I? For therapists, what kind of therapist was I? You know, and all of the things that sort of held together our lives beforehand seem to be gone. There's uh, also a lot of shame. As we know, we'll be talking more about stigma, but this is a very stigmatized loss. And there's a sense of shame that, uh, you know, how, how could this have happened to our family or how could this have happened to my client? Um, it's also common for a lot of blame and anger to be passed around. Um, often that takes the form of very simplistic explanations that, um, you know, this happened because of this. And that's a way... In some ways, it may be a way to avoid the fact that in these types of losses, there's always so much ambiguity, and we <laughs> humans do not do well with tolerating ambiguity. So those, those are some of the things that are commonly involved with losses in general. And then for uh, professional caregivers, there are additional components that can make things even more difficult, um, and, and I'm going to be specifying, you know, talking about what I know most about, which are for clinicians, even though this is going to basically uh, have overlap with other types of professional caregivers. But for clinicians, the extent to which the this devastating loss and anything about this can be processed is often compromised by legal and ethical issues, specifically around confidentiality. Um, you know, the confidentiality resides with the person who was lost. And so people will say, well, you're not allowed to talk about this to anyone. And so what do people need after a loss like this? They need validation. They need support. They need a place to process this safely. Professionals are told, shut up. You can't do it. Um, often access to the types of rituals that facilitate healing, like memorial services and things like that, um, are not easily accessible for professional caregivers. So basically, there are very few places to process the loss or even have it validated. Secondly, because this is so stigmatized, even in the mental health field, um, it's very common for, and again, I'll speak primarily about mental health professionals, to have uh, negative or at best unsupportive reactions from colleagues and supervisors. The um, case is assumed to be have been mismanaged, whether or not it in fact was. Um, there are often implicit and or explicit assumptions about the competence of the treating clinician. Um, the institutional reviews that happen after afterwards are often insensitive to the fact that the 
clinician is in the midst of grief and, uh, you know, the end, there's often at best isolation from one's colleagues who's, who are so sort of terrified of this topic that they stay away. Um, so I think as Vanessa mentioned, it's not surprising that many consider leaving the field. Um, I can, you know, and, and then it leads to this kind of split in one's identity that you have to hide this from your colleagues if you're going to function because of the way that, you know, if you get a negative reaction and a compartmentalization of the survivor self who is grieving in pain and the clinician self who needs to put up this good front. And we can talk a little bit later about uh, the stigma within the field and how that plays into it as well. Great, thank you. I know that both of you have experience in working with colleagues and professional caregivers in the field who have experienced the loss of a patient or client to suicide. Could you tell us a little bit about the common themes that often come up after a professional caregiver has experienced a suicide loss? One of the things for me that was really helpful after the loss of my sister was I was able to recall um, a class that I had in my graduate training where one of my professors kind of took took time out of the normal curriculum to talk about the fact that she had lost a patient on her internship and what a devastating experience that was, both because of her own sort of, you know, personal feelings about her work and the, the patient, but also about the stigma and the way our the way our field didn't really talk about it and how she felt these threads of sort of judgment about her competence or blame. And she wanted to protect us. She thought, you know, many of you may have experience of losing someone to suicide. And here's my experience. And here's what I went through. And when you, you know, when and if you go through this experience, I want you to know this so you don't feel so alone and you don't feel like you're the only one going through this. So I think one way that our field can do better is to talk about it and to share our stories. And, you know, if you're a supervisor and you have somebody you're working with who has lost someone, talk about, you know, your experience or colleagues you've known experience and talk about what it looked like in the beginning, in the middle, and how they sort of resolved it and got back to a sense of, you know, clinical competence and sort of integrating it into who they are as a professional. Um, I think that is lacking and could really help in the field. And I'll just add that doing what you're doing and getting this information out and disseminated um, is really important. Um, what we would like to see is that postvention information is included in prevention. Um, we're still working on doing a better job with, with prevention, but the, you know, to sort of know before this happens um, what the experience is like, what's normative about it, and what best to do about it um, so that when it happens, you know, you know what to do in order to optimally support the professional caregiver. So thank you for actually, you know, doing for doing this. This is exactly what we're looking for. So I think one of the important messages we heard and what the two of you just mentioned there is the need to talk about this more, share stories, share personal experiences and examples. And so I'm wondering if one of you may be able to share some of the experiences that you've heard within the field, either from colleagues or others that you've worked with in terms of how these types of losses impact a professional caregiver outside of the office. You know, can, are they able to just leave it at the office, or does this continue beyond the laws of the office? So I think one of the important things there is sort of the context in which the loss happens. Um, you know, I think some people have been uh, seeing someone in individual therapy multiple times a week for years in their private practice. Some people lose somebody that they've just sort of, you know, did an intake with or quickly met on an inpatient unit. Um, I think also sometimes there's a good team around. They have good, you know, peers and mentors that can support them. Um, 
if they feel like they've had a lot of good suicide prevention training and sort of feel confident in the work that they were doing. Um, sometimes I think depending on people's theoretical orientation, it can sort of have more of a profound effect on them. Um, and then there's the actual relationship with the client and how they felt about the client. So, you know, I think it's really um, spanned the gamut. I can think of people who, again, were working very intensively for a long time and really seen a client sort of grow and bloom in their work and not have much um, worry about the suicide risk and then all of a sudden be blindsided by the loss. And I think that's a really devastating loss where it's harder to, quote, unquote, keep it in the office because they're really sort of questioning those assumptions that Nina talked about initially. Um, I think that's a really hard loss to sort of, you know, work through. I think sometimes if somebody's working in an agency and there's a team around them that's really, you know, kind of ostracizing them or questioning their competence or reacting to them with, with a certain level of either, you know, distance or animosity, it can really affect them on a profound level where they're walking around not knowing if they can continue in the field, you know. Um, also, we've worked with a lot of people who are going through some sort of legal challenge to their work, and that kind of brings the, the grief course exponentially up you know, a bunch of notches, um, you know, one of the things is you're being blamed for the, the loss, and that's a hard thing to grapple with. And then another thing is just the amount of time in which the sort of legal um, proceedings go. It can be years and years, and you don't have much control over when they're going to call you in to be deposed, when something's going to happen. So that can really sort of affect the grief course um, that someone has. And Again, it's harder to sort of just keep it at work and manage with your life outside. Yeah, and I and I think in some ways there's, you know, as, as Vanessa said, there's, you know, it's hard. Even though there, you know, clinicians try to sort of maybe create that compartmentalization between the workplace and home, um, this affects you at so many levels that it's really difficult to do that. And I just want to sort of move back in the office because it's also very likely to affect um, clinical work going forward, particularly in the early stages. If, you know, it, it might, it's likely to affect the work with other people who were potentially suicidal, who are dealing with loss issues. And a lot of clinicians in the early stages have talked about how it's affected their work, and particularly if they have PTSD symptoms, um, you know, that, um, and again, these all intersect with personal issues as well as with the the stigma um, to sort of exponentially increase the amount of distress on, in both the professional and personal realms. Absolutely. I think both of you have spoken to some of the contextual factors that can underlie why one loss may feel different than another loss in terms of both within the same individual and across individuals, which I think is really important to highlight because there are so many factors uh, that moderate sort of that response. And I think, you know, what you're saying there in terms of there really isn't a clear separation between the in and outside of the office, right? Because we're the same person in both spheres. And so building on that a little bit, I'm curious to hear, especially based on the experience that the two of you have had in terms of losing a sibling, how you see our own personal losses to suicide, um, as well as the professional losses to suicide, how can those interact with one another? Well, I can talk about, I lost my brother this is 95 when I was in graduate school. And, you know, I thought that I had good relationships with my friends and with my professors. So I was really stunned at the reactions of people 
uh, basically the people who I thought with my were my friends, you know, after a couple of weeks of support sort of scattered, uh, one of my professors said that I was still, quote, too negative. And just to make a very long story very short, um, after trying to find some some other person that was talking about this kind of experience, I couldn't find any, so I decided to speak about it myself at a conference. And after that, people sort of came out of the woodwork and said, oh, yes, th- this is consistent with my experience. And so um, now I know consistent with my experience that the stigma is alive and well within the mental health profession, both around suicide, but also I think around uh, professional vulnerability. That is when uh, one of our own, i.e. a clinician, uh, becomes vulnerable in a way that makes that makes us one of them, and I think there's a kind of us them dichotomy within our profession. Uh, us being the you know the strong, the together, the the healers, and the them being you know the recipients of our care, um, the ones who are pathological. And so, what happens when one of us becomes one of them? And I think that's when we see a lot of the projection of the us's fear of terror of vulnerability being projected onto the them. And so that's what a lot of survivors, clinician survivors, have described as being pathologized um, or the grief being minimized. What's the big deal? It's only a patient. Um, And... And, and including the judgment and the blame around the clinical competence. Well, if someone is, look at her, she's a mess. So clearly she must not have been competent in the first place. So it becomes a sort of this very uh, circular stigma that sort of continues to add insult to injury. And I certainly experienced that. And I know, uh, Vanessa, did you want to share a little bit, bit about your experience? Yeah, I'm just thinking about our personal losses and and sort of the the way that um, reverberated. I mean, for myself, clinically, I'm not exactly sure how, but at least initially I felt able to split it off and my sister died and I was grieving outside of the consulting room. But it was sort of nice to have a space where nobody knew what happened and I didn't feel many effects on my clinical work, at least initially. Um, I think it can happen, and it does happen. I've talked to many people who, who you know, the, the loss sort of makes them so much more frightened of, of losing a, a client to suicide after that. And I think their, you know, um, supervision and support is incredibly helpful. Um you know, I, similarly to Nina, I think I just was appalled and aghast by our field and how poorly they were supporting me. Um, it, it tended to be my friends who were not in the field who who were better supports for me um, and sounding boards for what I was going through rather than my, you know, supervisor, therapist, uh, mental health colleague. So in terms of how, you know, how personal losses or how professional losses sort of intersect, I think that there's there's a lot of commonality um, and a lot of need for better support, you know. Yeah, I think it's another area where in some ways we define them as being separate, right, but there's so much overlap and as a professional caregiver, a loss in whatever domain or however you categorize that can impact um, you in multiple ways. I think that it also speaks to the amazing advocacy work that the two of you have done in terms of from your own personal experiences, but knowing what's true in your colleagues and what um, is maybe discussed in this field, still how hard it is to have this conversation. And so just wanted to pause and, and say thank you again for that strong pioneering work that I think you've contributed and where we'll continue to kind of chip at this and kind of get this conversation more and more out there. And in that lens, I think 
one thing we know to be true is that it is possible that these types of losses, when it comes to suicide, can also lead to professional growth. And so I'm wondering, um, either based on the literature or maybe um, experience, whether that be self-experience or with others that you can do, how can professional caregivers consider um, a suicide loss to be an opportunity for professional growth? Uh, well, I can take that. The, with, the, with optimal support, and I want to emphasize that, you know, assuming clinicians and caregivers get supported in their grief and are able to move through it, there's um, often a profound personal and, in this case, professional transformation. Um, that's true for general survivors, but also the form that it takes for, say, clinician survivors. Most, uh, most of the people who have, who have been supportive re report long-term benefits in the clinical realm, that would be increased knowledge and education around suicide, uh, more sensitivity both towards suicidal individuals as well as survivors, uh, reduction in what uh, some have termed therapeutic grandiosity, that's thinking that you know we can actually solve all problems and heal all peoples, and more awareness of what the realistic limitations of our own uh, power and control is. On a personal level, there's uh, generally a construction of new types of, shall we say, existential paradigms, a new way, a new normal. So that gets integrated in who am I as a person, who am I as a therapist, and how do I integrate this experience into all of that? And so things get reshuffled. Um, often there's gratitude towards aspects of life previously taken for granted. And in the case of survivors and clinician survivors, a lot of gratitude for those who have supported them in, in the grief journey and who validated their experiences. And almost always there's a desire when people are more in, have integrated the loss uh, to give back. And in this case, it's to support other clinician survivors which is why we have a lot of people in our task force, say on our listserv, who are feeling, saying, I'm ready now to do something to get this information out, to support other clinician survivors. So it's a, a, a paying it forward type of, of desire. Yeah, I just want to add, like, thank you, Sarah, you know, for saying that this was strong of us to do, but in a certain way, it's really... Um, enlivening and exciting work that we do because we've seen clinicians really shattered after a week or two of losing a client and saying, I don't know what I'm feeling. I don't know how I'm going to go on. And then we see them over months or years sort of, you know, gain their confidence, gain their footing, um, gain, regain their sort of belief in the field and that they can be useful. Um, and just on a personal note, even though I miss my sister, I wish she hadn't done what she did, I don't think I would have been, I know I wouldn't have been strong as a clinician in terms of knowing about suicide prevention and postvention and all of this sort of content knowledge. Um, but also I think that there's a way that I know myself and I know pain and darkness and resiliency or post-traumatic growth where I just sort of have faith and hope when I work with people um, in a really profound way that I don't know that I would have if I hadn't lost my sister. Um, and then just personally, uh, you know, not sweating the small stuff. I think that um, I was raising little kids in New York City with competitive school environments and everybody gets stressed over every little you know, be minus or, or anything. And I think that I really sort of had this very profound personal grappling with things and just realized kind of the joy in life and, and the strength and connection and how it's so much more important to celebrate the good things than worry about the bad. Um, so I've seen that both in myself and in a lot of clinicians who have had a loss. Yeah, I think what's inherent to what both of you described there is 
how important the environment and the support is around someone in order to enhance the possibility that this professional growth is possible and how there are so many factors that can really promote that type of journey. And so in that lens, I'm curious to hear what types of advice you'd give to those listeners uh, that have joined us today that may be professional caregivers in terms of what types of support you might recommend um, to them if they have experienced a suicide loss. Well, not to plug anything, but uh, Nina and I do have this <laughs> task force um, through the American Association of Suicidology, which has a website with all the reading you could ever be interested in, you know, anything that's been written on the topic. There's a bunch of testimonials that are really beautiful. There's a list of people who are willing to be contacted if you want to talk one-on-one. Um, there's a bunch of protocols for agencies to follow so they can support their staff. And then there's a listserv that we have that just has, you know, clinicians at any stage of of grief sort of coming there and talking about what they're going through and uh, receiving support. And I think what we're starting to see slowly around the country is that there are more iterations of some sort of local support networks that at least are offering, you know, a talk or a one-time uh, support group or maybe a hospital that's offering something so that, that we're sort of creating an army out there um, of people talking about this and uh, sharing resources. So, to, so, you know, Google and look for those sorts of support. You want, do you want to give the website address? Oh, sure. It's www.cliniciansurvivor.org. And also every uh, year AAS has a conference that travels around the country and Nina and I are always there with sort of, you know, a lot of programming for clinician survivors for learning about it and processing it and learning about what they can do in their communities to help spread the word. Great. And I think touching a little bit on what we had talked about before in terms of themes that sometimes come up where... Um, there may be isolation or maybe stigma or sometimes unsupportive responses or assumptions that can happen within the field. I'm curious to hear how you think that colleagues can support one another after a suicide loss. Because we may have some listeners today that have experienced a loss. We may have other folks that know another colleague that have experienced a loss. I'm curious what types of thoughts or recommendations you have for how colleagues can support one another when these situations come up. And as Vanessa noted, um, a lot of people have worked really hard to develop good protocols, say, for agencies after this happens, and almost all of them will say, be very aware of the, the stigmatizing reactions and rumors or you know, sort of try to curl, curtail that um, in your particular agency and specific ways to support the client. I mean, one of the the ways that Vanessa alluded to is uh, try to learn as much as you can as an agency about what's normative about this loss for clinicians or caregivers and communicate that to the clinician that what they're going through is not pathological, but it's in fact normal and support them in that. Um, ideally, as Vanessa noted, if either you or someone you know has experienced this loss, uh, try to make that connection. I mean, that's one of the things that we do through the task force is connect people with someone who has been there, who has done that, who gets it. And finally, they're getting their experience validated and heard in a way that, you know, it's not really easy to do with someone who's never experienced this. Um, to it, to the extent that, you know, the person, the clinician that's affected is, is having, say, PTSD symptoms and is feeling overwhelmed and their, their clinical functioning is affected, uh, support finding out whether they can get some short-term accommodations for their workload, maybe a reduction in the highest risk uh, patients or clients for the short term because that's going to be triggering 
to um, someone, anyone who's experienced a, a suicide loss. So in general, things like that, that, you know, to us seem like common sense, but to people who do not have the experience and who view this as uh, the, the, the caregiver who's experienced this as, as pathological, it, it doesn't make sense. So really sort of getting these things on the table, built into um, prevention protocols so that people know how to best support clinicians in the aftermath. Also, and Vanessa can talk more about this, talking about some of the things that are common um, that people are confused about. Well, what do we do about the family? How do we have contact with the family? Because that's often very confusing. And Vanessa's done a lot of work on creating uh, very good uh, protocols and guidelines for that. Would you want to talk about a little bit about that, Vanessa? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of mixed messages. I think that a lot of people are very terrified of meeting with a family, that the family might blame them, that the family might ask questions that they're not going to be able to answer because of confidentiality, um, that it's not legal or it's not allowed with, with a liability insurance carrier. So, um, you know, with all of Nina and I's research, uh, most of the the experts in the field in terms of the legal issues say that it's it's good it's it's good for your uh, risk to reach out to the family and express condolences and to meet with them. You're much less likely to be sued, um, and it's also often really therapeutic for the family and the clinician to have that meeting because you get to, I don't know, meet each other and say that you cared about the person that you've lost and maybe, you know, learn some things from each other. Um, you do have to be careful, you know, in terms of whether or not it's it's um, sanctioned by your agency or your malpractice insurance carrier. Um, and you do want to be thoughtful about the timing of it and the needs of the family and the sort of you know, cultural needs of what the family might might expect or want. Um, and you have to know who sort of has the privilege for the confidentiality. But basically just showing that you care and showing that, that you have been impacted by the loss as well is incredibly helpful for survivors and therefore can be helpful for you. I just wanted to add in terms of what Nina was saying about, you know, support and getting support, but oftentimes I think it's important to just, you know, if you have a colleague that lo has lost a client, to ask questions, to say, is it helpful for me to ask you what you're going through or would you like more space and for us to just, you know, do our clinical work, quote, unquote, as if nothing happened? Because sometimes people want the space to be able to just, quote, unquote, you know, go back to normal in their agency or, or in their place of work. And sometimes people really want the space to be able to process it. And sometimes that'll change week to week or month to month, but just to be able to sort of be flexible and to know what, what the uh, caretaker needs, um, you know, and maybe they need a little bit more supervision time, or maybe they need um, a little bit more lunches with friends, you know, that are just sort of, taking their minds off things and laughing, or maybe they need some direct talk about the actual case, or maybe they need to just, you know, process what, what's going on overall for them. But to sort of keep asking and checking in to make sure that they get what they need, I think that's really helpful. It's harder for the person who's lost somebody to speak up and say, would you guys please do this for me? So it's helpful for other people to say, would this be helpful or would it be more helpful if we didn't do this and to find out. I just wanted to add sort of one thing that has more to do with, with agencies. Often after the loss of a, a client or a patient to suicide, there are what, what's called an institutional review or could be called a psychological autopsy is to, you know, get that delayed as much as possible because during the early stages of the loss, the clinician is likely to be in, in shock, in the shock and disbelief sort of phase of all of this and is not really going to be able to process things logically as would be required during these types of, of reviews, which optimally are framed as learning opportunities. So to sort of, again, 
Um, if you're in a position where you're trying to figure out how to manage this in the aftermath, um, if you can factor in the normal emotional state of the affected clinician or clinicians um, in terms of saying, okay, well, when are we going to do this review? Um, you know, how are we, you know, how can we support you in terms of contacts with the family? So, so again, sort of keeping a balance between the legal and ethical requirements after a, a, a suicide and be, between the, the, the legal and ethical issues and the emotional support issues because often the legal and ethical issues take precedence and the emotional support is just pushed way out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I think what you both shared there really showcases how there's need for practical kind of day-to-day, month-to-month support um, that we as colleagues can do for one another that is actually no different than what we might do when it comes to other types of losses in our life. And I think, uh, Vanessa, you spoke to that beautifully But then also, Nina, I think that's an important point that you just touched on in terms of kind of these administrative kind of supervisor systems level um, considerations that are also really critical to thinking about how we can optimize the suicide postvention process. So absolutely, we want to learn on how we can improve and making sure that um, we're enhancing the care that we're providing to those that we see but also making sure that that process is happening in a supportive um, way that allows the professional caregiver some time to have that experience of the law before getting into some of those kind of logistical or administrative details. I also yeah. wanted to say thank you for the teaser for um, our listeners may know that we're putting many of these types of podcasts out and we'll have one that's specifically focusing on kind of ethical and legal considerations. So if that piqued your interest, feel free to come back and check out a podcast specifically on that topic. But I wanted to to wrap up, one, by saying thank you again to the two of you for joining us and to see if you had any last words um, before we wrap this podcast today. Again, I wanted to thank you for, for doing these podcasts and trying to disseminate this really important information. Yeah, and for all of you who are listening who have lost somebody, our hearts go out to you. There is support out there. And for all the administrators who are worried about this, there's a lot of support that you can give and and there's a lot of strength that can come out of these sort of devastating losses. So thank you for highlighting this in this podcast. Absolutely. Well, thanks again. And to our listeners, if you're interested in this topic, feel free to check out the series that we have specifically on suicide postvention. And we hope to um, talk to you again next time. This podcast is brought to you by Uniting for Suicide Postvention, USPV, in collaboration with the American Association of Suicidology Clinical Survivor Task Force. USPV offers suicide postvention resources designed for family, friends, acquaintances, employees, supervisors, managers, and professional caregivers, including mental and medical health providers. USPV is funded by the Veterans Health Administration Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention. Thank you for listening, and be sure to check out our other episodes in this Suicide Postvention series.